The Squire of Gothos, episode 17 by air date, 18 by production order. And uh, what do we got? We've got a we got a director, Don McDougal, and Paul Schneider. He's the writer, and he submits stuff late. Not as late as Harlan Ellison, <laughs> but he's, he's late. Had an excuse for everything. Oh, I had a blowout on the freeway, my tire, and then it went rolling down the, the embankment. I had to catch all a bunch of BS. Writers have all sorts of excuses. Uh, but he did a good job, I think, on uh, including a little bit of uh, hunt hunting humans for hunting games. humans yeah yeah yeah, yeah. that's always in a favorite. playful in a playful way yeah yeah i like it i like it you look at the primary hall yeah this particular scene that they spliced in of the enterprise approaching you has the big dish in front uh-huh this the uh, satellite dish in the front Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The big see, satellite. it's larger. It's larger yeah. than the primary hull, uh, secondary hull down there, the front yeah. part. Yeah, uh -huh. and, and I, it's the early version. I like the later when, and they'll splice it in. You'll see it, and it'll change between the during an episode, and you'll see the smaller one. And yeah. Okay, and so let's. Uh, that's a good point, but let's start out by talking about what this episode is about. You want to tell people what this episode's about? What is this episode? This ep I'm telling you. Yeah, is, I know. I'm telling you that this, if you watch this and you didn't know about it and find out later that this guy is a kid, it is awesome. Spoiled little brat. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it's, it's, I think he's great. I think the actor's great. So they're going through this vast nothingness of space, right? They're all a, kind of bored. A desert. A desert, yeah, the desert, which is a big discussion of what the desert is. Do you want to explain Spock's desert as opposed to people's, uh, humans' deserts? <laughs> a vast, arid wasteland or something like that. <laughs> Our fascination with deserts. I think I think Spock makes a, makes a reference about people's fascination with deserts. Yeah, a romantic kind of a thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And he's like... Yeah, they're not that fascinating, really. We're 900 light years from that kind of desert bones. The precise meaning of the word desert is a waterless, barren wasteland. We are orbiting the lone unrecorded planet in the star desert. Oh my gosh, it's even called a star desert. So they, so this is a little patch of nothing. Uh-huh. Uh, but they weren't orbiting that planet when they were going through the desert. They just kind of came across that planet. Right, because they said all of a sudden it was like undocumented, right? Right. Mm -hmm. yep. uh, and and they couldn't imagine that that. So I thought they were like the first starship out there. So when he's saying he can't imagine why it was a, an uh, undocumented, I thought, well, it makes sense that it was undocumented. So then they're just going along, and all of a sudden, Sulu goes bing, and he's gone. They they do have a sound effect, and now. Whether or not they heard that on the Enterprise, I don't know. But uh, but then Kirk is gone, and whether or they not they heard Kirk disappearing, I don't know. Exactly. Uh, do that again. That was great. <laughs> so they're down. On, so they're they're going. Oh, and I love I love Spock's reaction to it because they're like, full stop. It's like, I, I know he has to give a very definite command there, so it makes perfect logical sense. But he's like. Uh, full stop or something like you know whatever he says right there. It that's, was really kind of that's right. But he, but he was quick. Once he noticed yeah. that he was gone, I I think I would have gone. Uh, but he knew right away that you, you should be getting away from what, you were going towards something and something happened. You better back up. I would not yeah. have been that quick. Yeah, he was very fast with it. He was very fast and and very direct with his command. I kind of like that. I like that he was. Excuse me, try not to do that in the in the recording. But uh yeah. So then Spock, they're gone. Emergency. Full in reverse power. And that's the end of the teaser. I mean, yeah. boom. Yeah. Yeah. But wait, I have a comment here before we go into the first act. Well. Oh. What? Okay. Let's go into the first let's do your comment. Uh 
um, at the beginning of the episode, they're um, handing out coffee all over the place. Yes, Every exactly. Yeah, yeah. She comes in with the tray, hands it to Sulu, and and the navigator already has a cup. It's like they already went around once, and everybody goes, "Whoa, whoa, whoa yeah, me too, me too." Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sulu gets one. He's drinking. Kirk gets it. McCoy gets it. McCoy drinks. Navigator drinks. McCoy drinks again. We have never seen so many cups since uh, Charlie X. Charlie X, I think, introduced the cups. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's I think in you're right. Meeting room where he says he's just a boy. He's a man. And yeah, like, yeah, 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 yeah. Buddy, or something. I don't. Know. Yeah. So okay. you're right. I mean, they they have that, and someone did kind of make a comment that those things are just kind of sitting around. They got no lids on them. No, what are those sippy cups, like you call them, the little sippy cups? And he's so, putting the, the cup on the navigation console, which is at an angle. Yeah. So because it's empty and they're filming, I'm sure it just sits there. But if I was the captain, what are you going to spill that all over your console? We're going to have sparks. We don't have fuses in these things. It's just going to blow up again. Japanese people, they do not eat, drink, or anything. If they're going to eat and drink, they're sitting at a table. When they're done at the table, they don't eat or drink anything as they're walking around like we do in America. You won't see anyone with coffee cups walking around or food snacking like we do here in america it's a really cool culture but so so i think maybe spock's character might be more japanese style where he doesn't just do it as a normal because all the rest of them you know they're actually the whole crew looks to me like they're american even sulu although he was japanese uh you know he's he's taking the uh was he japanese in did he play a Japanese character? He did, right? Because they wanted him to do an Asian character. They had everybody, so his his ancestors, Asian, just like what we got Chekhov later on, right? Chekhov, yeah. Well, Chekhov, you definitely knew he was from Russia, right? But but I don't think we knew Sulu was from from Japan. I think he was pretty much Americanized. Okay. Cleaned up. Now you got you got McCoy up there. You, you're kind of fascinated with McCoy's the way he moves his face and his lips and stuff. You've mentioned that in other episodes. Yeah, and I shouldn't. I shouldn't. I this think you. Awesome. I think you said his tongue too. Right? In one of the episodes, his tongue was sticking out. Exactly. He's got a yeah. lot, a lot of mouth stuff going on when he's emoting and and doing something in the background. In this case, he's drinking and and when you and when you freeze frame it, it's easy to pick out fun funny stuff. Yeah. 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 Okay, but look at uh uh. <clears throat> Zero one three four one nine. Uh, mathematically perfect brainwaves. I love. Oh, yeah. I yeah, love yeah, yeah. his line. Yeah. I I think of that a lot myself. I'm gonna go look that up and see how he says that math in this episode. I can't imagine a mirage ever disturbing those mathematically perfect brainwaves of yours. Yeah. <laughs> And then the reason I took uh, screenshots of Sulu and Kirk when they disappeared is I wanted to compare them later on to when they were standing because the the writer Schneider what he he had them go into a marbleized effect where they were they were marbleized he said we don't know if that means he looked like marble or whatever and they are saying this is all costing too much so they just quickly made it where the sulu and kirk are on that platform and they're bathed in green light with a green yeah yeah yeah, yeah 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 and then when they came to life they turned off the light and they're done boom okay they appeared and saving tons of money they were just going ha ah, this is getting expensive uh but i wanted to see if they bothered to have don't they have those uh script those people that sit around and take pictures and uh, write down. Oh yeah. Yeah, 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 right. And so they would have to memorize the way they were positioned and then get them into that position when they film the other shot, when they reappear, when they are reanimated again. So I put those side by side later on. Well, if you look actually, Sulu's kind of moving. He, he's not perfectly still in the shot. No. Yeah, no. he moves. Yeah. I. I yes i am agreeing with you about the movement yeah. 
I yeah. was merely commenting. I took screenshots to compare the before and after. Uh -huh. He appears to see if they've got how far they deviated from position. Right. No. Yeah. I and I got that about what okay. you're saying. I'm just okay. saying Sulu. Sulu wasn't able to hold his pose. That yeah, kind of a little shaky there. That's because all so, the coffee. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I can't, I can't hold it. So <laughs> then you've got uh, Spock uh, after they disappear. He says the decision will be mine, Doctor. Yep. Um, and, and you're I'm right. He is, he is back in his little cocky Galileo 7 mindset there. That's he, correct. They asked him in Galileo 7, well, who's going to make the decision? Well, the decision will be mine. Well, here, yeah. he's top of the food and shade, and then he says the decision will be mine again. And it sounded similar to the episode we just had watched. Yeah. So then I don't know why they wrote in Spock's lines for the next little part here that you have where we got uh you know coming from the surface uh greetings and solicitations or yeah. sorry greeting and felicitations and, and uh pronounced yeah tally -ho. tally ho tally ho so but he goes uh basically if spock or sulu's character i mean if um kirk's or sulu's character are sending that up their sanity has to be in question and oh. i just thought i just thought that was hilarious like <laughs> I mean, I don't know how Spock logically jumped to that that conclusion that it could that be one of those two. Okay, um, you can't see it in the uh, in fi at fifty five five twenty seven, but all the buttons on the captain's console there under his hand are no longer green, 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 green. They have changed the, them to multiple colors. Nice. And then uh, were you just showing all oh, the nice chairs? Yeah, those chairs came from the conference room, I think. Aren't those a conference room chairs? Yes, they are. And they are gorgeous. And when the two guys left, so the two uh -huh. guys are there and they're they're supposed to get ready to go down yeah. to the planet. Uh, the chairs are twisted as they leave and then they swing back into position. And in that shot, you get a good view of the front and back of them as they're moving. And they're they're slick. Those were white chairs, right? And then they added the black bolsters on top for the show. And Presto change we have enterprise chairs. Enterprise chairs, there you <laughs> With go. No seat belts. <laughs> <laughs> Didn't they just send them out to Home Depot? I mean, not Home Depot, Office Depot or Staples to pick those up? Yeah, with all the salt shakers that Matt Jeffries needed for all his little doodads. Yeah, we just gotta just go grab some of those. So that's nice. Well, I'll show we'll the, the audience the chairs. So they're I'd like ready to have to some if, if someone could reproduce them at a reasonable you know, like people make their own stormtrooper out outfits, like the 501st, yeah. right? The 501. Yeah. Uh, couldn't someone make some fiberglass replicas of these classic chairs so that we could have them sitting on our <laughs> sun deck? You know, they've got to be. There's got to be some around. You know, I, I mean, they're sitting defunct in someone's garage is what they're doing. And I don't mean, I don't mean the original. I mean, people have already replicated those chairs. They've got to have done that. Yeah. Uh, they added the. <clears throat> this is this is not the first time. I believe that we see the laser beacon. I think the laser beacon is, if I'm not mistaken, I should have should have looked at this up. I think it's sitting on top of the one of the pontoons of the uh, Galileo shuttlecraft when they when they're when Spock is in the back working on the. Oh, is that right? Yeah, I, there were there were a variety of tools, and I think one of them was this laser beacon. I will, don't quote me on it, uh, but I'm I'm gonna quote you every day. <laughs> <laughs> so this is our first shot in of the in this episode of the laser beacon at least it's the first mention of the laser beacon right in the series spock walks in at six minutes and 41 seconds and he says and he's holding it and then he hands it to the guy right yeah i don't know who designed who was the guy that you just said designed all those things uh uh, uh feinberger and matt, he must, matt jeffries he, and feinberger uh he had a tiny, tiny budget. You could tell. I mean, his budget must have been pennies. I got two two uh, comments on <clears throat> on this. Uh, one is the gear that they're wearing right now, where we're at. Uh, yeah. Someone mentioned I'm reading the book, a book, and uh, they said, "Hey, what about those uh, naked time suits? We'll have them wear those." Uh -huh. And they looked at that and they said. Well, no. once the audience or we stop laughing, no way. We're not doing those uh, those suits they made out of that bathroom shower yeah. 
curtain yeah, yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What they messed up on this episode is Gene Runberry, I think, hired uh, Gene Kuhn to fill in because they were swamped. Yes, uh -huh. I think I got this right. And Kuhn thinks that Gene's taking care of firing the drafts or the scripts, the first part to uh, NBC for review. Uh, uh -huh. and, and Gene's thinking, uh, I got Kuhn here now. <laughs> he can take over some of this. So they miscommunicated. Nobody wants to communicate, I think, with NBC anyway, because they're just going to bitch and moan about something. Uh, right. And it never went to NBC or it got there late. A week uh -huh. before instead of because all this NBC is paying for that they want collaboration and they've got they got to say something and so the guy who does that reviewing stuff at NBC's name is pause this Stan Robertson I believe NBC production manager Stan Robertson was rightfully irked and he wrote Coon uh I uh, the music I've got to comment on the music what? I don't know who did the huh Go, go ahead. I, I'm, I'm dying to hear. I don't, I, I don't know who did the music here, but I thought it was pretty cool the way they, whoever uh, edited in the music. First, they got the castle one, right? Like the shot you have of the castle here. Yeah. Uh, I forget exactly how it plays. I'd love to just play it right here. And then they're walking to the castle and it's like this kind of scary music. And then they're kind of at the castle and it's a, uh, so they do three transitions really quickly on the music score right at this time here. And I thought it was, I thought it was pretty cool because even if you're kind of losing interest, that music kind of like grabbed you back and just brought you right into the scene. And and I just and then the but I, I was kind of I thought it was funny that they play that scary music as they're walking up to the castle. Yeah, they could have put any kind of music there. Right. But they do the the Frankenstein kind of music. It wasn't that that wasn't that scary. But but the score was, you know, so so they go inside that's pretty cool i i do like uh this and then they look at the artifacts now you were did you say this i know that we saw oh yeah the trap salt but you said this before uh so it must have been when we were watching the man trap you said that that's used again in maybe the, the squire of gothos do you remember that yeah and they had a this, this was um this was part of the script that schneider wrote that that he was portrayed as a hunter because they had more of the, I think more of the angle of hunting humans. Okay. Uh -huh. We have a little bit of that in this episode where Kirk offers himself up to be a yeah. game, right? Yeah. But because the writer was showing off that this guy, uh, the squire is a hunter, he would have heads, stuff, animals and, th and game stuff he, he caught. And so, uh, Justman or someone said, "Hey, we should we should just put our existing things that we've made for the show in there." And it looks uh -huh. like, and and there is a there is a lizard kind of looking thing sticking out of the wall. It's not the Gorn, but some lizard head. And then these two guys, the mm -hmm. the salt vampires from the Man Trap, and I think to the right of it, someone's got to know. Uh, to me, that looks like the guy the Burks somewhat like the bird creature in the in the cage that's to the right of oh yeah, Pike yeah, yeah in the menagerie or in the cage right well that would be yeah that'd be good to know so you're you're then you're going to the stills of uh captain kirk and sulu <laughs> Compared and sulu is a bit out of position but he did a pretty good job there don't you think he, he was pretty good he remembered that he, he was almost 90 degrees on his arm right yeah we're just seeing him from a different angle it's pretty good and he has his fingers straight right and you know i think there's a polaroid though is is that how they would have they, done this i bet they did i bet they had him pose on the bridge they had that shot right and m maybe a polaroid or whatever did they have and then that they, did they have the the kodak land camera I, I i don't know but you know those guys had pretty probably had pretty good turnaround overnight anyway right with the oh, cameras sure they would have looked at dailies and they would have said, sure Memorize yeah. your position because you're going to use it. Yeah. Where he's sneaking up on, he's sneaking up on uh, the one crewman sneaking up on the squire. Yes, gotcha. I referenced that mirror uh, later, but not this. I got to see it because, like, what? I think they were thinking that the audience was stupid because that's the stupidest freaking thing I've ever seen. Everybody knows, I think, since you're a half a year old, six yeah. months or maybe even younger, that a mirror does a reflection 
And so you cannot sneak up on someone with this massive mirror. We got to put that in there, this massive mirror where the squire can see him sneaking, uh, quote unquote, sneaking up. I mean, I tried that, uh, sneaking up on someone once and with this massive mirror in front of them, it, it just didn't work. It did not work? <laughs> it didn't work. Can you tell me, uh, let's see, we're at 15. It has to be somewhere around, uh, here they are, 13. Give me an idea, there they are. And he, he tells them not to. Yeah, don't do it yet. Yeah, don't do yeah, it back yet. Back off. Yeah, so mine shows 1350. 1350, he's looking right at him. He's got his hands up. Is that what you're looking at? His hand up It's like this, the squire's hand, and he's looking right at. Uh, he's saying, tat, tat, tat. Or whatever, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. It, it's a terrible, 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 terrible thing. I mean, if they had like some sort of opaque, some other type of mirror or something, it would have been okay. But they, they really could have cleaned that up. I don't know what they were thinking, except we're running out of time. Let's just get it in the can. But I, but there's no way that the crewman can't see that the squire's looking directly at him as he's quote unquote sneaking up on him. Uh, Honestly, Love the character. Love this episode. I love almost everything about this episode. It's it's a really, really great episode. I love the way he goes crazy shooting at the shots that you have next at 1455-22. And Devastating. <laughs> yeah. I mean, he's just, you know, he's just taking his little toys he's brought around from, like you said, his hunting around. With, and he just destroys them. And he's like, yeah, that's fun. You know, I, it's it's such it really is such a childish thing to do, and uh, hilarious, hilarious. So you got your big uh, now these ones. I wonder how much these shots uh, actually cost them to do these special effect shots. When they when he fired, yeah, on fifteen oh one twelve, you got yeah. the little starburst coming out of that. Yep, I mean, I wonder yep. whose idea was that. And, but they had, come on, they had to animate each one of these frames. This is not like uh, put the path for start here and there, phaser beam, this speed. Yep. That's this is hand painted? Hey, I just noticed. Look at the side of the, of the starburst blast. Who's looking through that porthole above the chair? Who is that? That's the dog from the episode uh, the enemy within when they couldn't beam up the dog or the dog split the one mean one you can tell that's a dog from them no isn't that the i can't tell it's too small for me it's those stupid wire things no it can't be it that was a real yeah. dog with a bunch of stuff on him but i saw the wire what would he call those things uh the pipe cleaners coming out of that head oh like, yeah oh my God, yeah, it's yeah. Not... yeah. I said anything i didn't say anything that was just in my brain, right? I was just thinking that, not out loud or anything. So then we have the squire trying to teach Captain Kirk a lesson. Now this is a throwback to the very first, no, to the uh, to the cage, right? We're not the cage, but the the two ups parter. They did the same thing in there, right? When he's suffering he's out in the fire, a fairy tale that you used to listen to as a child, or something like that. And they threw him into the caustic atmosphere right yeah yeah but right. that that's the same kind of shots as they had in the other episode uh, almost in, exactly the, in the cage shot. yeah there was however there was dripping sulfur and 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 yeah 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 yeah, yeah. now it wasn't the cage though because we haven't watched the cage yet it was uh the menagerie the menagerie thank you okay so then you have the dish the dish again <laughs> okay now right yeah uh that looks like it's the large one to me yeah i think so too and it has the the spikes coming out of huh. the nacelle cups at the front yeah what what are you trying to refer to at 21.0000 uh oh oh oh, oh when so he Fox, says, Fox got he a says, lock on. so he says what does it mean tell me tell me what it means uh, remember the beeping Spock says something about uh, it's ready to. He's got a lock on him. Right, beep, beep. and he goes. He says something about. Uh, here, let me get the. Let me uh, do a search and. Uh, oh, I just del deleted my Squire uh, Q and uh, what? What would you said? Mean maybe? Let's see here. 
Precise meaning, you mean you actually have sensational? Do you mean, what does he mean? Here we go, Trelane. Here's the, here's the passage. Uh, Captain receiving transporter signal, says McCoy, Trelane. Transporter signal, what does he mean? You must yeah. tell me. It yeah. means Trelane, dot, dot, dot. And then that's what I put in there. And then at that point, for whatever reason, that whole section from of Kirk talk, talking and saying, the party's over, thanks to Mr. Scott, what are little, little girls made of? Mm -hmm. uh, what is, uh, what's Roddenberry's wife, uh, uh, Majel Barrett? Majel Barrett. So she's playing, uh, she's playing the nurse, Nurse Christine mm -hmm. And she's talking at the table while the robot, the Android version of Kirk is, Androids don't eat, right? She's, oh, here, you have something, have something to yeah. eat. Well, that line, she, the camera's from the back pointing towards him and she, you can't see her mouth. They added the line, uh, here, have some of this food, whatever that line was. Well, that was, I, I say looped, but that was added. It wasn't like they were fixing some noise situation. So what do you have on this actress? So he's dancing with the actress and 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 this is, this is a common theme in Star Trek, I think, where Captain Kirk is very antagonistic. He gets very angry and antagonistic and leave our people alone while, you know, uh, Oh, and that's what you're referring to right here, isn't it? Right? Wait, the smirk? Are you at uh, the 29? 29, 29, I'm at 292223. I had jumped over the Spock line. Spock oh. wasn't even supposed to even appear in this episode. He wasn't? He wasn't written in. They wrote Janice, the, the writer wrote Janice in because he didn't know that uh, the yeoman uh -huh. had been fired. She was supposed to play that Vic, what's her name? Vic, the. Uh, Oh. oh, the one that's dancing with uh... Uh, uh, Vanita Wolf. Uh -huh. Vanita Wolf was supposed to be, of course, the Yeoman Rand character. Uh huh. Why did I bring that up? Because we were talking about. See, I already lost my train of thought. I well, like... we were talk. We were talking about Yeoman Rand and and the uh, the mm -hmm. dancing and Kirk. I mean, you were saying there was a, a line that Spock did that I jumped over, but I don't see your line in here. Uh, 2518. You jumped over the, uh, the Kirk smirk. I just really screwed something up because all your pictures are gone. 2513. 2518. Okay. Oh, yeah. I don't like your tone. Are you challenging me? Is that when he slaps him? No, that's Kirk slaps him. But no, this is where... Kirk is watching Spock and the Squire duke it out. Yeah. He the Squire says, I don't like your tone. Are you challenging me? And and Spock is saying, I object to intellect without discipline or I I do yeah, I think to, you're right on the, the number there. You I do have right. to get the right line because it is it is very well done by Nimoy. Uh yeah. Uh he says, uh, what is it? Uh, challenging me. object. Uh, I object to intellect without discipline. I object to power without constructive purpose. Oh, Mr. Spock, you do have one saving grace after all. You're ill-mannered. <laughs> A human half of you, no doubt. And he chuckled. Ah, oh, come my little wood nymph. Well, while that interchange is going on between those two, you can see Kirk first looking at Spock and he knows he's gonna tear him apart. Spock, Kirk knows that Spock is gonna tear him and he's, he's smirking. And then he looks over it at the squire as Spock is delivering the line. You get to enjoy Kirk going, this is why I hired me, this guy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <clears throat> I, just, I just think that he does it so, uh, Shatner does it so well, his little. Uh, so if if Leonard Nimoy was not supposed to be in this, then they wrote a lot for him in this then. Uh, yeah, had, they had to, yeah, they had to change stuff up. Yeah. What's the lady's name who did Amok Time? Who wrote that? What's her name? Uh, uh, Amok Time? That was a guy that wrote Amok Time. No. Amok Time? Oh, am I wrong? Dorothy Parker? Yeah. Didn't no, Dorothy no. She didn't, she didn't write Amok Time. Okay, then she fixed it, right? And showed the cops in that episode. In that. Anyway, it says here, notes came in from other staff members, including Stephen Karabatsos. And having been invited to give notes in an unofficial capacity, Dorothy Fontana, and one of them wrote, 
respectfully submit Spock would go along with the landing party. So he wasn't even he wasn't even in on this deal to begin with. So they changed the script. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> go ahead. So then we <clears throat> we have the squire flirting with the girls. He likes girls. I like that he likes girls. Right? He's like right away, oh, you got the females on your ship? I mean, it was just, it was an incredibly little cute. The, the, the actor just plays it so well. The whole, he just, it's unbelievable how well he plays, I think, the character. Women. There are 400 men and women aboard that ship. Get the right line. Women, he, do you mean that you actually have members of the fair sex among your crew? Oh, how charming. And they must all they and they must be all very beautiful. And I shall be so very long to them. Here, <laughs> let me fetch them down at once. No. No. <clears throat> this game has gone long enough. Those are crucial operating personnel. You can't I can do anything I want. <laughs> I, I just love, yeah, he's so arrogant and so just there. And and he wants a family. He kind of wants a family, I think. He's trying to build his little family. He doesn't know Wait, how to do it. He's an only child. Come on. No, no, I know, but that's why. I mean, he, no. in a way, he's reminding us. Uh, and he, you already mentioned it, Charlie X. I mean, in a way, it's it's there are reminiscences of Charlie X in this thing, right? Yeah. I think. I mean, I don't know if that's what, really what you were saying when you referred to Charlie X, but I think that there's some little bit of Charlie X in here. And yes, he says. A Nubian prize, yes. taken on one of your raids of conquest, no doubt, Captain. And according to the book I was reading, the no doubt from Kirk was ad lib. Oh, really? No doubt. So Kirk doesn't get it here. He fires at his machine, uh, blowing oh, up his machine. Do we have? Uh, at uh, you're saying at thirty two, thirty three. Uh, did I skip something point? you wanted to cover? I think we we talked about the Nubian prize, and we yes, talked we did. about. And uh, uh, I, I did want to make a comment about 3104. Um, when I watched this episode, I noticed two big reveals for me. I didn't realize the way the room is laid out in my mind was different all these years than what I noticed this time watching it. And in at 3104, that's the end of a big pan all the way from the mirror across the piano across the wall with the stuff on the wall, the stuffed heads, and this table where they were eating straw, uh, uh, the, eating the straw tasting it, it, Tasty food, yeah, yeah. Right? The, uh, all the way over to the door. I didn't yeah. realize how, the, how this was laid out. That table in my mind all these previous years was not perpendicular to the door like it is there. I th uh -huh. thought it was, Okay, well, I should draw it out once. <laughs> um, that was uh, one thing. Uh, and then uh, 30, 31, 41. Um, there's a big, big part of a blooper reel where everybody busts out laughing after Kirk says, are you challenging me to a duel? And this is the, this is them about to uh, burst out in laughter. Not in this which cut, one? 30? Not this cut. Uh, 30, 3144. But many takes later, they obviously got it right. But in They the finally blue, were able to get it. in the blooper reel, these three yeah. are busting up something big. Wow. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so you, you got to, to uh, 3233 where you said, hey, he's pointing at him. And then he moves well, over 32, to the fight. Well, you know, you're talking about the duel, so Captain Kirk slaps him on the cheek a couple times. Uh, uh, the slap was at... 3001. 3001. So he slaps him and he's like challenging him. He's going, well, we're going to do this the old fashioned way, right? And the squire, he, in his infinite wisdom, he's, he's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do this, man. Let's, let's, let's rumble. Except he, he's, uh, you know, he knows, I think he kind of knows the vulnerability of, of humans, right? Already. He knows he can't shoot Captain Kirk because he's going to do some serious damage to his body. So he's just Kirk, monkey. Or or ants, just, right? He could yeah. accidentally, he, he's got a, yeah, General. yeah, he could just accidentally kill one of them, and not—that's not what he wanted to do. So he just points up at the roof, and he's having fun. He just shoots up, and where everybody's kind of the tense moment of worried yeah. about Captain Kirk's character, Kirk's or like, Captain Kirk. No, no, yeah. no, no. Let him play through this. Yeah, and then he—I uh, 
I love that you got his his eyes his eyes wide shut. Yeah, I bet he was a little bit afraid of that that uh, blasting cap with it because that looks like pretty heavy smoke powder on that thing. Yeah, that mirror wasn't very well made though because it in in your shots as you have the frames go on and on the whole mirror is gone actually. Well, and then part. Huh? Oh yes, by the third frame, all those pieces have been knocked out. Yeah. Oh, but it's, I wonder if it's a continuous shot. I, uh, this is. Didn't Kirk say something? Uh, something to the effect of when he got back on the ship, let's just get the hell away from here, or something. Something very similar to that. That's his number one priority: is to get away from that planet. And it's hilarious because he can't do it. It just, you know, it's not going to happen. Yeah. So, um, you know, talk about uh, space warping and whatever else the squire was doing. It was. It's hilarious. Oh yeah, and he says. Turn in your glass slippers. Uh, the ball is over. And she says, gladly, Captain. Gladly, Captain. So, yeah. So we got our door closed, and then we've got... Uh, <laughs> oh, closed, huh? <laughs> <that's> <laughs> cool. And we got Captain Kirk back down on the planet. He's back down there, and he's getting tried for... Uh, I don't know if he said treason. I'm not sure why he's trying them. He just didn't like them. I... Uh, I want to say that at 30 40 i really got the impression that kirk was thinking what he thought in charlie x he has the gun in his hand and he's looking down he's not looking at the squire he's got the gun and he's got to do this duel and my impression is when he is thoughtful like that he's going like he did in charlie x i'm going to take him on i get the idea that the the costumes and the sets were kind of dirty. Uh, I think it's in the next gen when they're talking where they integrated the original series with next gen. You know that episode? Uh, that was Trouble of Tribbles, right? They took the Trouble of Tribbles and redid it. Now, is that Trelane in the first shot there? It doesn't look like him coming it, around that tree. It does not, but I believe there's no cuts. And I think it's mm -hmm. just because of the, the poor capture quality. I saw that too and I go, is that a stunt guy? Uh, okay, so now you've got him trapped in his little uh, his little cage. Uh, unless you want to talk about the stick, trying to hit him with the stick. <laughs> no, no. Uh, so the cage thing, right? He takes a step forward and he freezes, and then they add that, and then he mo and then he moves again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You could definitely tell those uh, those stop sh shots in that. I mean, it's pretty pretty uh defined right there yes but amazing when you watch it how did they do that <laughs> <laughs> uh yes because i i think mccoy asked him a question right uh this, this episode is called uh squire squire here we go uh what an interesting weapon uh, in this case oh here we go spock got it does your does here, um, nothing, nothing has any taste at all. It may be unappetizing, Doctor, but it is very logical. And there's that magical word again, McCoy says. <laughs> does, your, does your logic find this fascinating? Does your logic find this fascinating, Mr. Spock? No. Fascinating is a word I use for the unexpected. In this case, I should think interesting would suffice. You yeah. don't find this unexpected, Mr. Spock? That his food has no taste, his wine no flavor? No. It simply means that Trelane knows all of the Earth's forms, but none of its substance. So uh, here he explains the that word thing, and he has the eyebrow thing going on. We're getting more Spock um, per yeah. episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we should we should call that something. More Spock per episode. So that would be M S P E. Almost an episode wrap because we need to give our our points to this. Oh, it's been so long. Didn't we, yeah. Didn't we skip a week, and then we, and then we did Galaxy Quest. Um, oh, okay. Good. I was looking at the next episode down below here. There, the Kirk is going to disappear again. It's like God. What is it? <laughs> did you see right there? He's he's going to get whisked off this ship again. Um. Okay. This episode, rating. Uh, yeah. uh the Squire steals the show. Yeah. Um. Absolutely absolutely and all around good he's he's the show i mean 
It's unbelievable. Yeah. And it's fun. And then uh, did I did I had had I mentioned that it said there that uh, the writer Schneider had revealed that this was a, a small anti-war, subtle anti-war. You did. Why don't you go into that a little bit? I will. I will read the two, two sentences on it. It's subtle, um, and I didn't realize that. I just watched it for the, and I've been enjoying it all these years for the humor. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I know the joke at the end that he's a kid, but I watched the whole episode over and over every time, and I love it. But uh, one comment here was, the writer later acknowledged that this was a subtle anti-war story, mocking prejudice, aggressiveness, territorialism, and violence by seeing these negative human characteristics mimicked by an immature boy wanting to play soldier. Uh, oh. The Squire of Gothos presents a study of human behavior through the eyes of a self-gratifying, narcissistic, alien child. And, that's, <laughs> and then it said, the writer later acknowledged that this was a subtle anti-war story. Well, come on, the 60s. Things yeah, that's right. yeah. were in upheaval. That's cool. I love that, uh, you know, there's this other show that I'm watching right now that I'm kind of addicted to. I had no idea it even existed. I didn't even, I stumbled on it and I, I won't get into what it is, but the writing is phenomenal, phenomenal. And on this one, if this really was kind of like that position, juxtaposition, I mean, it makes perfect sense that this is what it is. I mean, you got this crazy little kid just going nuts, right? And uh, really not caring about the people that are there. I mean, although he does have some respect, I think there, he has a little bit of respect for him, but not a whole lot. Uh, oh, so we have to grade this thing. That's kind yeah. of what we talked about just hours ago, moments ago. Uh, this uh, this is very fun to watch. I can watch it all the time because of William Campbell's performance as the nutty professor. No, as the child. Mm -hmm. So it's an easy uh, 85 or 6. 87. 80. 85 or 6, okay. For some reason, I really liked it a lot. And I'm going to, yeah, 87. I'm going to go 87. Yes, I give it a solid 87 with you. I bumped yeah. my, yep. So I'll have to put that in here right now. You mm -hmm. said, don't look at the previous. <laughs> I know, because I, I know you're going, they're too close. They're too, I'm bunching them up too much. 87, yep, sure. Yeah. Uh, we'll, we'll inch underneath in the 90s. What's going to make it into the 90s, though? Oh, uh, for me, uh, definitely Amok Time's one of them. It's going to get right up in there in the 90s. Uh-huh. I, I uh, thought Amok Time was brilliantly written, brilliantly done. I mean, there's not a whole lot of Amok Time. We were looking at Galaxy Quest, and and, and it's, an, it, it's, it's honoring the fans. Anyway, well, this was great. This is a good one. Totally. Hey, I got uh, I got ourselves uh, hopefully uh, an editor. I'm gonna be. I've kind of talked to her a little bit, and I'll be talking to her some more. She just uh, she's gonna see if she can do it or not, and see. How she's. I saw some of her videos. She did an excellent job on her videos, but it's a bit different than ours. You know, ours is more talky. Hers is more like having fun at the beach and stuff like that. So hers are more action with the. Uh, I what hope, do you call it the drones and stuff like that i hope she can interweave the like references screenshots or oh i bits. i think that's going to be simple for her yeah that'll be just so she even made this beautiful uh and i don't have the link up where i'd show you but a beautiful little thing that uh, tells what her channel is right it's yeah. just it's beautiful it's it, it's not like the writing that i would like for ours but for hers because hers is kind of adventure and beachy and it looks exactly like you're on, you know, like maybe a whole, you know, uh, it's just really pretty. So, so I'm sure she'll do a nice job. I'm kind of excited about it. Excellent. All right. Yes. All right. Well, Bruce, I'm going to start calling you uh, Skeeter. Oh, I. <laughs> or or Mr. X. Which one do you like better? I better sh I better click my little participants thing and. Yeah. Yeah. Because Skeeter's got a, oh, I click the button, there you are, and then I say, more, rename, what am I today? Last time I was Spock. 
today i'm skeeter huh All skeeter right. Well, there we go. Oh yeah, this is great. So I have yep. two monitors on the top above my, uh huh, and your and the Zoom meeting window is straddling both monitors. So I have this split. I got Kevin on one side with his face, and I've got the Squire on the other. They're all in the <laughs> meeting here. I got three faces. Cool, cool. So awesome. So uh, Bruce Skeeter. Yeah. Yeah. Fuck. What's going on? What do we got what here? We, What's going on? What, what are we doing today? Why, why are we here today? I have an episode list that says what we're, why we have uh, brought you here today in this meeting. Um, yeah, you got night. <laughs> I uh, mean, it's it, like, it's like uh, Scotty's uh, tools on the last episode, right? Where he's using those little goofy looking toys to to oh. like calibrate the phaser and you know yeah, yeah exactly yeah exactly yeah. so and that's why and so i like these uh, i like to look at this stuff uh when they beam down the planet oh yeah the they voted. galaxy quest man galaxy quest i'm glad we watched galaxy quest because that's all he does he kind of pulls it off and that eh, seems okay to me instead of doing an actual real check you know to see if the if it's if it's not going to cause some permanent damage as they the longer they breathe it i mean because this by is this where time, it comes from the galaxy quest thing right i mean this yeah. is the first yeah. is this the first episode where he does he pulls it off and he goes and he yeah. says it's okay it's like yeah. Yeah. What? <laughs> uh, uh, mccoy does it in the first episode man trap he puts his he takes the salt tablets and he oh yeah yeah it looks it yeah and he looks it yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. oh okay what you don't know where that's been <laughs> it's so funny that they just like they're just like uh so cavalier i mean it just does it, honestly again we go back to the mind sucking uh machine that uh, the machine that just drains the brain and kurt getting under there and wanting to just play around with it like it's this massive toy that he could just like oh well let's try something else you quit uh, harping it, on that one <laughs> Well, no, but it's the same thing, right? He's just gonna pull that off, and seems okay. And I'm a little faint, but let me. Ah, uh, yeah, it's like sniffing glue, right? You just you don't do it just once. You kind of sniff it. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, he's going. I just can't. You want a laser beak? Are you kidding me? Here you go. <laughs> okay, here you go. Boom, boom. 